Let's have a bit of music to put us in the mood. Okay, enough of that. Let's just have a think about what the contents are going to be in this talk this evening. Oops, let me just get that sorted right here. So we're going to have a very brief think about what is said in the Gospel of St Matthew to put us in the mood for what it is we're talking about regarding the Star of Bethlehem. The Magi, the Wise Men and the Star in the East. We'll then have a think about what astronomical candidates could possibly explain the Star of Bethlehem. In other words, we're going to have a look at a few possibilities and ask ourselves how well do they fit the account that we've just described in the Gospel of St Matthew. We'll then have a quick think about dates as to what astronomical objects appeared in the sky at around the time of Christ's birth, and we'll ask ourselves are there any events that we know about that fitted the timeline that we're talking about. And then what I would normally do is then switch to Starry Night Planetarium software, which for some reason doesn't seem to like cohabiting with Zoom. So I'll show you a video of the Starry Night software playing back the clock to a few years BC to give us an idea of what was in the sky. And then I'll wrap up. And then we have mulled wine and mince pies, I presume. OK. <laughs> so the Magi and the Star. So the principal elements of Matthew's account that we're trying to explain here, I've highlighted in these various passages. So the Magi journeyed to Jerusalem and they were prompted by, quote, a star in the east. Bear in mind that if we're looking at the Bible, the Bible does not say that they followed the star. This is quite a common misconception, mainly due to what I've just played you, the Christmas carol, um, We Three Kings. So they didn't follow a star, they were prompted to journey to Jerusalem and they were prompted by a star in the east. So in red there, that's the first thing we have to explain. When they got there, they asked King Herod, uh, what's this we hear about uh, the signs in the sky about the king of Jews? And uh, Herod was unaware of what they were talking about. So we need something to explain why they thought a star in the east was heralding the birth of the king of the Jews. And we need to have some sort of an explanation as to why Herod didn't seem to know what they were talking about. The Magi then journeyed on to Bethlehem, where the star reappeared. So if we are going to find an astronomical explanation for the star of Bethlehem, we have to have something, ideally, which can reappear in the sky. And it is said that it stopped over Bethlehem. So is there a reason why we can find uh, an account which talks about a star that stopped at a particular point in the sky over a town? So ideally, those five things in red, it would be nice if we can find an astronomical candidate in which each of those five points is addressed, in which case we may have a candidate for the star of Bethlehem. Let's go back to the carol again. Okay, that's enough of that for the time being. But I wanted to introduce those lyrics, explicitly the We Three Kings of Orient are, and then at the end of that particular verse, following yonder star. And we can unpick that because when we actually look at the Bible and think about the three kings of the Orient, well, actually in the Bible, in, in uh, Matthew's account, there is no mention of three. It talks about wise men or magi, if you prefer, depending on the translation. But it doesn't say three. Um, it's simply assumed that there were three wise men or three magi. Why do we assume there were three? Well, there are, there's talk of three gifts being brought to the, uh, to the baby Jesus. The gold, Frankenstein and myrrh, 
So if there were three gifts being brought, it was assumed that presumably there were three people, rather than four people, one of whom said, I didn't know we were supposed to bring gifts. So three kings is not really correct, because there's no actual explicit mention of three. Well, whilst we're here, well, actually, they weren't kings either, so we ought to take that out of the uh, the song lyric as well. Because it talks about wise men or magi, but nowhere does it talk about them actually being kings, other than in this particular Christmas carol. So it's not we three kings, it's not three, and they're not kings. Are they from the Orient? Well, no. The Bible doesn't say they came from the Orient. It talks about them coming from east of Jerusalem. That could be the Near East, the Far East, it could be India, it could be Mongolia, it could be a whole range of the Orient, but not necessarily what we now think of as the Orient. It simply means further east than Jerusalem. So we three kings of Orient are, we've just got rid of the three, got rid of the kings and got rid of the Orient. And as I said earlier, the Bible talks about being prompted to journey by a star in the east. They didn't follow a star in the east, otherwise, of course, they wouldn't have got to Jerusalem. They would have ended up going um, out towards Japan. So following yonder star is incorrect as well. So you can see this particular Christmas carol, once you start unpicking it, there isn't an awful lot left that actually agrees with the Bible account. Now, I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, so I tend to like precision. And so if things are wrong, I prefer to remove them. So if a physicist was writing this Christmas carol, we would get rid of three kings, Orient and following young the star, and the carol would be something more akin to we indeterminate number of men of unspecified geographic origin are who saw a star. Now, you can see why physicists don't write Christmas carols, because it doesn't meet her quite as well as the original We Three Kings of Orient are, which everybody remembers from singing in school when they were knee-high to a grasshopper. And again, being a physicist, we shouldn't be talking about certainly not three kings, but not even three wise men, because three is never actually mentioned. We should really be talking about N wise men where n is a number between 1 and infinity. It's definitely bigger than 1 because men is plural, so we know there were more than 1, but we actually have no idea of how many actually went to uh, for the adoration of the Magi for the baby Jesus. So that's something to bear in mind. That's simply a little bit of folklore, and that's where a lot of people remember the myth of the Star of Bethlehem. Rather than thinking of Matthew's account, they tend to remember the Christmas carol, which is incorrect in many, many ways. Let's also remind ourselves as what is actually meant by a star, because a star doesn't necessarily mean a star in the sense that we understand it today, especially amongst uh, astronomers who know exactly what the difference is between a star and a planet and a moon. But uh, in the past, star could mean almost anything. Remember, wandering star is a star that moves in the sky relative to the fixed stars, and that's what we would now call a planet. And a star that seemed to have a long tail would be a hairy star, or a comet, as we would now call it. And even today, we find that people still call meteors shooting stars. It's just a, it's just a rather more romantic way of referring to the same phenomena. So when we talk about stars, we should remember that star effectively means anything that could be seen in the night sky. If you like, anything in the heavens other than the sun and the moon. Everything else is fair game to be called a star, and we shouldn't be too literal in our translation when we think about the star of Bethlehem. Does art tell us anything? If we look back over the centuries, are there any clues in any pictures that we can find that, that depict the adoration of the Magi? Well, not surprisingly, most of the images that we see are not historically accurate. They are simply what the public expect to see if a painter were to paint the Adoration of the Magi. So um, in no particular order other than, I think, alphabetical, we have a few examples here. And in the background, we can see what appears to be the Star of Bethlehem, perhaps shining the radiance down here onto the baby Jesus, the the, uh, the radiance of God perhaps coming down from above, shining down on the baby Jesus as the Magi, which are almost universally depicted as three for no good reason, as I've said, other than the fact that there were three gifts brought to the baby Jesus. Uh, if we look for, for instance, Botticelli, 1475, 
Uh, this, it is widely believed, is Botticelli on the right-hand side here, um, basically photobombing the image and looking into the camera. Um, we can see, I guess, a star of Bethlehem shining down on the baby Jesus. Uh, I'm also guessing that this is Joseph in the background, who doesn't seem to be taking any part in the celebration here. Well, perhaps that's appropriate, because allegedly he didn't have any part to play in the conception either, so perhaps it's appropriate that he's not really uh, engaging with the whole celebration here. Uh, 1423, another image with uh, what appears to be a star in the background, but it doesn't give us any clue as to what this star might be. Giotto is one of the few back in 1305 who actually depicted uh, the Star of Bethlehem, not as what we would now believe as a star, but what we would now call a comet. And that is why one of the uh, probes to uh, Halley's Comet was actually named Giotto after this particular depiction of the Adoration of the Magi showing a comet in the background rather than what we would treat as a purely a star. Rubens, um, I don't know what's going on here. I don't seem to see any star in the background uh, for this particular depiction of the Adoration of the Magi, though we do appear to have a double-headed camel, which is interesting in its own right, but doesn't help us uh, regarding the Star of Bethlehem. And here we have another depiction, 1655. Um, not much going on there other than we assume that that must be the Star of Bethlehem in the background, again shining down onto the baby Jesus. Van Lint, 1630, again, the three magi, by popular consent, that's the number that everybody has chosen, and the Star of Bethlehem, but again, no real clue as to what's going on. But we don't really expect to get any clues from art, simply because art is depicting what everybody expects to see, rather than anything that actually gives us any clue as to what was actually going on there. Now, we're all astronomers, but we have to recognise that astrological significance plays a major part in what's going on here. Every planet, every bright star, every zodiacal constellation has or had an astrological significance. So, for instance, if we look back at the records, we find what uh, connotations there were between planets and stars and constellations and particular uh, deities or particular properties. For instance, Venus was associated with beauty and with fertility and with birth. Jupiter was uh, associated with royalty and is, uh, Jupiter is often known as the king of planets. We know it is the largest planet in the solar system, but even in the early days it was considered royalty in the sense of being the king of planets. Regulus, a star, uh, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo, was known as the King of Stars, hence the name starting with R-E-G. And Leo itself was associated with the line of Judea, the, the Judean flag, or icon if you like, uh, depicted a lion. So anybody seeing a lion in the sky would relate that to the line of Judea and relate it to the Jewish people. So astrologers were always looking at the sky and associating these various properties with the planets, the, the wandering stars, or the appearance of a comet, or the stars themselves, or the constellations. And that was because it was believed that anything that happens on Earth is being, if you like, telegraphed by the fact that there will be signs in the sky telling people what to expect. Either next year's crop is going to be great, or there's going to be a disaster, or there's going to be a flood, or there's going to be a new king. So, in other words, everybody treated the sky as if it was God's Facebook page. That's where interesting stuff is going to be posted. If you keep an eye on the sky and watch for things changing, watch for what's different tonight compared to last night or last month or last year, you will get a heads up as to what's likely to happen down here in the realm of man. So that's the idea of astrology. If you watch the heavens, you will get advance notice of what's going to happen. So let's ask ourselves about what possible candidates we could be talking about. In other words, let's think about what could be interpreted as the Star of Bethlehem and ask ourselves whether or not it meets the criterion for is it possible that the star we're talking about could have been considered a star in the East? Would it have been a significant apparition or appearance? Is it reasonable that Herod wasn't aware of this particular apparition? And is it possible that this star could reappear in the sky? And is it possible that the star could stop in the sky? So we're going to ask those questions for each of a number of different candidates.
So firstly, is it possible that the Star of Bethlehem was a meteor shower? Well, meteor showers are interesting enough. Could it be interpreted as a star in the east? Well, it doesn't seem likely. We all know that meteors can appear virtually all over the sky. They appear to radiate from a particular point in the sky, but the meteors themselves could appear pretty much everywhere. Would it be significant? Well, meteor showers occur throughout the year, quite a few every year, and they, generally speaking, occur year after year after year. So they're relatively predictable, the showers, not individual meteors. So there's no reason why you would attach any particular significance to a particular meteor shower. Is it reasonable that Herod wouldn't be aware? Well, certainly there's no reason why Herod should take any significance by the appearance of a particular meteor shower, because, as I've said, they are quite common and they appear every year. Would they reappear in the sky? Well, the meteors could appear one night and then again the next night and then again the next night. So they could certainly reappear over a period and over many months it's possible that a meteor shower might occur at one time of year and then sometime, some many months later, another meteor shower could occur. So it's possible to talk about the meteor shower reappearing in the sky. But having a star stop in the sky, there's no easy way to interpret a meteor shower and link that to the fact that a star could stop in the sky. So a couple of ticks, but a couple of crosses, so that doesn't seem like a good candidate. What about a comet? A comet could certainly appear in the east. It would be significant if it was a very bright comet. If it was hardly bright enough to see, then perhaps not. But if it was a bright comet, then it might be considered significant. Is it possible that Herod wasn't aware of it? Well, if it was a bright comet, surely Herod, or more likely his advisers, Herod himself was partially blind, so he would be relying on his astrologers telling him what's going on in the sky. If it was a bright comet, surely he wouldn't be unaware of its existence. Could it reappear in the sky? Well, yes, comets are going round the sun, and for a while a comet might appear on one side of the sun, and then for perhaps weeks or maybe longer it might be blocked by the presence of the sun, and then it might reappear on the other side of the sun some weeks later. So yes, the star could reappear in the sky. Could it stop in the sky? Well, it's not clear how you could interpret a comet as stopping in the sky. It is possible, depending on the orbit of the comet, for the comet to uh, for a little while come towards the Earth and therefore not appear to be moving to the east or moving to the west from night to night. So maybe that's a possibility. I put an X there, but maybe it should be a question mark. So again, some possibilities, and some people do indeed believe the Star of Bethlehem was a comet. What about a nova? What about a new star? Strictly speaking, not a new star, simply a star that's become bright enough to see where previously you weren't aware of its existence. So temporarily, a star brightens enough to become visible. Could it appear in the east? Well, yes, no reason why it couldn't. Would it be significant? Well, yes, again, depending on how bright this star appears. If it was only just visible to the naked eye, it's unlikely that would be considered significant. But if it was quite bright, yes, some significance could be associated with the appearance of a new star. Herod wasn't aware of it? Well, that really just depends on how bright this nova is. Could the star reappear in the sky? Well, nova can recur in the sense that a nova could appear, its brightness could increase. Generally speaking, the brightness of the star would then fade away. And although they can be recurrent in the sense that they could then brighten again, they tend to brighten not over weeks or months, but over years or decades. And so it's unlikely that a nova would brighten in the sky and fade away and then brighten again a few months later to reappear in the sky. As for the star stopping in the sky, well, a nova is effectively a fixed star. It would appear just like all the other stars once it had brightened enough to be seen. And so it would move across the sky, just like all the fixed stars do. In other words, unlike a planet, it would not be moving relative to the other stars. And therefore, the concept of the star stopping in the sky is rather difficult to, to square the circle there. And so we put a cross against that particular point. What if it was a supernova? 
Not the same animal as a nova, but simply a much brighter version of the same thing, you suddenly become aware of a star where previously you hadn't realised the star was present. Usually the result of a star, a massive star, coming to the end of its life and effectively blowing the outer atmosphere of the star out and going up in, in uh, luminosity by an enormous amount. Could it appear in the east? Yes, a supernova could in principle appear anywhere in the sky. Would it be significant? Yes, if it was close to us, if it was within a few hundred or possibly even a few thousand light years, it would be bright enough to be quite significant. Is it possible that Herod wasn't aware of such an object? Again, if it was that bright, why would Herod or his advisers not be aware of such an object? Could it reappear in the sky? Well, a supernova is a star, usually, coming to the end of its life. And once a star has come to the end of its life and exploded, well, it can't really do it again. Once a star has gone supernova, that's it. So it's difficult to see how you could have a star that's a supernova reappear in the sky some months later. Possibly it's, its brightness could change a little bit, but it doesn't seem likely that it would be quoted as reappearing in the sky. And again, for the same reason as the nova, the supernova would not move relative to all the other fixed stars, and therefore, why would you say the star stopped in the sky? So, four possibilities, but none of them seem to fit the bill. Let's move to the fifth, and not surprisingly, this is the one that turns out to be very interesting. What if it's a conjunction of planets? Planets move um, across the sky, they're all wandering stars, remember? Every once in a while, two stanit planets will come close together in the sky and appear close to each other. And I'll look at the mechanics of that in just a second. Is it possible that two bright planets came close together in the sky in the east? Yes, that can indeed happen. Would it be significant? Yes, depending on which two planets and how bright they were, that could indeed be regarded as significant. Herod wasn't aware of the, uh, the star of Bethlehem. Well, perhaps he was aware of the fact that two planets had come close in the sky, but maybe his astrologers didn't attach any significance to the fact that two planets were close in the sky. In other words, the interpretation of the astronomical event might be different between two different astrologers. So maybe it's possible that Herod wasn't aware of what the Magi were talking about when they said, what's this we hear about the birth of the King of the Jews? Is it possible for the star to reappear in the sky? Well, yes, the planets are always on the move, so two planets coming together could indeed be um, followed some months later by the same two planets coming together in the sky again. And therefore, yes, that particular star can reappear in the sky. Can a star stop in the sky? Well, the planets are wandering relative to the fixed background stars, but again, for the reason I'm about to show you, it is possible as the planets move through the sky, it is possible that for a brief period of time, the planet can appear to stop in the sky and then start to move backwards. So let's have a look at this mechanics of conjunction, because as you can see here, it seems to fit the bill and it is possible that it ticks all of the five boxes that we're trying to address in the account of St. Matthew. So let's just remind ourselves how planets move in the solar system. We have two planets, it doesn't matter which planets they are, just two planets, one of which is closer to the Sun and one of which is further away from the Sun. And the important point is the length of time it takes a planet to go around the Sun depends on its distance. So hypothetically, we could have two planets as seen by, let's imagine we had an observer fairly close to the Sun, let's imagine there's another planet close to the Sun and we're looking and we see these two planets in the same direction of the sky at this particular point. And if we run the time forward, because the inner planet is going faster, we can see they're now in different parts of the sky, but here they would appear to be in the same part of the sky. Again, they're in different parts of the sky, but at some particular point of time, those two planets will appear to be in the same direction. It's unlikely they'll be in exactly the same direction because the orbits of the planets aren't actually circular, they're elliptical, and they also are in slightly tilted orbital planes, so quite often one planet will just go over the top of another rather than pass right in front of it. So conjunctions are quite common, but getting them lined up perfectly is quite rare, though you will often see 
uh, planets within a, uh, maybe a, a degree or so of sky, um, that would be not so uncommon. But before we move away from conjunctions, there's one other aspect of planetary motion I want to cover here, which is quite important for what comes in just a couple of slides time. And that is, if we imagine what happens, remember I've just shown you that in this case the inner planet is moving faster, so it does more orbits in the same time that one of the outer planets does an orbit. And that has consequences. If you imagine that the green planet is Earth and the red planet is some planet outside the Earth's orbit, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc., because the Earth is actually travelling faster, Usually, the outer planet will seem to drift, it will wander through the sky from west to east. But every once in a while, because the Earth is going faster, it will actually overtake it on the inside lane, as it were. Just imagine two cars going down the motorway. If one car is going faster, what you see for the other car, it seems to be going backwards. So what's actually happening is we can see the position of this planet on the sky, but as the Earth overtakes it on the inside, what we actually see for the path of the planet is it goes from west to east, stops in the sky, starts moving backwards, stops again, and then starts moving forward one more time. So that's what's called retrograde motion. Normally, you would expect the planets for most of the time simply to be drifting from west to east. But if we see that one more time, it goes from west to east, but at some point stops in the sky, starts to move backward, stops again, and then starts to move forward. That is quite common, in fact it happens all the time, for the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, etc. It's most noticeable for the planets closest to us, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. It's less easy to see that for the more distant planets. So bear in mind this so-called retrograde planetary motion, which can occur where a planet appears to move, stop, go backwards, stop, and then start going forwards one more time. And it's simply a, a result of the perspective of us on planet Earth watching that particular planet because the Earth, for a little while, is moving faster on the inside track, as it were. Let's have a think about the timing. Now that we've said that we've got a few possible candidates, let's see which of them seem to match up with the timeline that we're interested in. So when was Jesus Christ born? Well, the bottom line is we don't know. It is widely believed that he was born around 6 BC, uh, but the margin of error is at least a couple of years either side. And many people believe that Christ can't have been born any later than 4 BC because Herod died in 4 BC and we all know the story about uh, the, the king and the, birth of, uh, and the birth of Christ. Before I go any further, just one thing to bear in mind is if you look at the time scale here, Notice there's no zero. We're going from 4 BC, 3 BC, 2 BC, 1 BC. There is no zero. It jumps straight from 1 BC to 1 AD. So if you ever use any software to dial back the clock, bear in mind that some software, some planetarium software, incorrectly places a year zero in between 1 AD and 1 BC. So if you're ever trying to reproduce what I'm about to show you in terms of when objects were in the sky, bear in mind that you need to check your software and make sure it doesn't add a zero if you go backwards in time through 1 AD to 1 BC. So it is generally thought that 4 BC was um, uh, uh, the, the death of Herod and therefore Christ must have been born a few years before that. But there are biblical scholars, I'm not amongst them because I'm just um, relying on what I read um, from what other research has been done. There are people who believe that the death of Herod has been miscalculated. Bear in mind there's no document from 10 BC that says this particular event occurred on 10 BC, this particular event occurred at 8 BC. Of course, all the events are based on some calendar or another, but then we have to relate it to the Christian era catalog, uh, calendar and try and relate it to the calendar that we're used to. And in the case of King Herod, King Herod was reported to have died uh, in the year that came after the eclipse, that came after the flood, that came after the something else. In other words, all dates are relative to other events. All events are dated by other events, not by an absolute calendar necessarily. Or if we want to relate one calendar to another calendar, we have to match up events in the two calendars. And a, a number of people believe that when working out when 
King Herod died, they have the wrong eclipse, perhaps possibly even the wrong flood. And hence, King Herod didn't die in 4, he died in about 1 BC, not 4 BC. And that means Christ could have been born in a few years prior to that. I don't really understand why there's a gap between 3 and 4, but that's what I am told by the people who studied the, uh, the Bible and tried to work out the chronology of what happened when. So we believe Christ was either born 6 BC, give or take a few years, or maybe about 2 BC, give or take a year. So what was going on in the sky around that time? Well, in terms of comets, remember we thought that was a possibility. Some people still believe it's a comet. In 12 BC, Halley's Comet was uh, doing its rounds of the solar system. We don't believe it was particularly bright in that particular passage of 12 BC. And if it was bright, why would a sign have been indicated some six years or more before the birth of Christ? That seems like a little bit too long a lead time. Why post something in Facebook if it's not going to happen for another six or eight or ten years? Other comets have appeared, for instance, in 5 BC, Comet Home. Some of you might have uh, taken pictures of Comet Home, uh, sorry, Holmes, when it came round a, a few years ago. In, uh, in 4 BC, uh, another comet, um, Cheryumov gerasimenko um, better known for the comet that uh, Rosetta visited and dropped its little lander Philae on. But both those comets, Holmes and, uh, um, let's just call it um, the Rosetta comet, both of those comets were probably not too bright. It's difficult to work out how bright they would have been. It's very easy to work out where the comets were in their orbit. It's relatively easy to calculate that because that is almost clockwork. But working out how much the uh, comets would have evaporated, how much of a tail they would have produced, how bright they were, that's altogether more difficult. So that's why people say comets are like cats. They have tails and they're unpredictable. So both of those comets are unlikely to have produced a particularly spectacular display in 4 or 5 BC. What about Nova? Well, according to the Chinese, there was a Nova in 5 BC. And according to the Korean records, there was a Nova in 4 BC. So no, bright Nova don't come along very often, and it looks like there was nothing for decades, and then two come along back to back doesn't seem very likely, so it's generally believed that something has been slightly miscalculated on the Chinese or the Korean calendars or their conversion to the Christian calendar, and that is actually one event that, that happened somewhere around 4 or 5 BC. But for the reasons we've already said, a nova doesn't seem to fit the bill for the Star of Bethlehem. So what else have we got? Well, we do have conjunctions, and here I'm using the symbols. This symbol here of two circles with a line between them is a standard astrological or astronomical symbol indicating conjunction, and the symbols next to them are the standard symbols for the planets. So here we have the symbol for Jupiter, here's the symbol for Saturn, and here's the symbol for Venus. And they're down here on the left-hand side in case you forget what's what. So there was a conjunction between the bright pattern, uh, the bright planet Jupiter and the bright, brightish planet Saturn at around 6 or 7 BC. But what I find most interesting is this particular event here. This particular conjunction was actually a series of conjunctions that occurred over the period from about 3 BC to 1 BC. Not only does it fit the timeline, it also fits the interpretation for the reasons that I'm about to show you. At this point, I would normally switch from PowerPoint to uh, a planetarium software, which for some reason doesn't seem to be getting on with Zoom this evening. So I'm gonna show you a video of what I'm trying to demonstrate here. So I'm gonna dial the clock back to, um, in this particular case, perhaps, the, uh, perhaps it's not too clear, so I'll point out what the uh, relevant uh, words are here. We're looking at August, 3 BC. That's the time period we're looking at. We're clearly looking in the direction of Leo at the moment. I don't know where we should be on the Earth looking at the sky. I don't know whether we should be in the, the, near, uh, the Near East or India or the Far East. So I'm not going to take a particular point on the Earth. I'm asking what does the sky look like as seen from the middle of the Earth? 
Okay, so that's just a convenience rather than pinning it down to a particular location somewhere in the in the east of uh, Bethlehem or Jerusalem. So I'm clearly looking at a, a fair chunk of sky here. What I've done is fix this star map to look only at Leo. Other things will be happening. I'm not going to show exactly where the horizon is because I don't want to get things too confusing. And I'm not going to label all of the stars and all of the planets because, again, that gets very confusing when you run the clock forward at the rate of a day every second or so. Lots of things will be happening and too many labels simply gets confusing. So I'm looking in the direction of Leo in August of 3 BC at 20 past 6, about tea time or so, something like that. I'm going to keep Leo fixed for the time being. What I've labelled here is Jupiter, just as a point of reference. And this planet coming up behind it is Venus. And remember, the, con the particular conjunction I'm interested in is a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus. So starting from the 1st of August, let's just run forward a few days and see what happens. OK. Whoops. Let me just... Get my cursor back. Sorry, I need to be a bit more control of the cursor. So there we go. Let me go back just a little bit. So on what appears to be August the 12th, Venus and Jupiter are quite close together in the sky. At this particular um, time of year, this is what would happen in the east. So this is, roughly speaking, visible in the east. The sun is just out of the way. In other words, the sun is often in this part of the sky. But at this time of year, the sun is just out of the way such that this particular conjunction would be seen in the east. Venus and Jupiter quite close together. What do I mean by quite close? Well, I mean Something of order half a degree, remember, is the diameter of the full moon. So if you get two bright planets within a degree or two, that's quite interesting. If you get them within half a degree, that's quite noticeable. In other words, two bright points fairly close together in the sky is something that would make you sit up and take notice. Venus and Jupiter. Venus, remember, astrologically could be interpreted as fertility or birth. And Jupiter is the king of the planets. So we've got birth and we've got king because Venus and Jupiter are very close in the sky. In which constellation does this particular conjunction take place? It happens in the constellation of Leo. So an astrologer might interpret this as Venus and Jupiter in the constellation of Leo, birth, king, Judea, the birth of the king of the Jews. So that could be the first heads up that the astrologers obtained. Now let's move forward in time. What's going to happen is because Venus is an inner planet, Venus actually moves quite fast and um, will disappear from our view whilst Jupiter continues on. So Venus is disappearing, but look what Jupiter is now doing. Jupiter, if I can stop it there, Jupiter is now right next to Regulus. Regulus is this bright star, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo. So Jupiter, remember, the king of planets, and Regulus, the king of stars. So Jupiter has just passed Regulus. The king of stars and the king of planets have just passed very close to each other. Let's move on in time. We're now in September, coming through to October of 3 BC. Jupiter is continuing to move forward, but remember what I said about retrograde motion. Jupiter moves forward, but at certain times of the year stops in the sky and then starts to move backwards again. So this is part of Jupiter's retrograde motion. So we're now moving to 2 BC. This is January of 2 BC. Jupiter passes Regulus for a second time because it's now going backwards in its retrograde motion. And we're now in spring of 2 BC and Jupiter will once again stop in the sky and then start moving forward again. And so Jupiter passes Regulus for a third time. Let's just stop it there for a second. So the king of planets and the king of stars have just passed each other, not once, not twice, but three times over the course of a few months. Something interesting must be happening. King of stars, king of planets, three times, a triple conjunction, 
Clearly something is happening about one king dancing around another. Maybe the crown is about to be passed from one king to another king. So let's see if we move the clock forward what's going to happen. Jupiter has now finished its little retrograde dance and will continue moving off to the east. Coming up behind it is Venus. Let's see what happens. Jupiter is now moving on. Venus is getting closer and closer and closer to Jupiter and at some point, bam, in June, on June the 18th, 2 BC, at approximately 20 past 6, Venus and Jupiter are extremely close together. Not just close in the sense of less than the diameter of the full moon, not just half a degree. They are extremely close. They are so close that I don't believe any human being would be able to distinguish them as two points. They would be considered as effectively the same thing. So let's just move forward and see just how close they are. This is now the same sort of view, except I've now centred on Jupiter because I want to zoom in. Thank you very much. I want to zoom in and see just what Jupiter looks like in terms of its distance from Venus. So let's zoom in so we can see just how close this conjunction is. There you go. The angular separation of Venus and Jupiter. Venus is shown here as its rocky surface. Of course, either by the naked eye or by a small telescope, we would see Venus shrouded in very bright white clouds, which is why it's so bright. And the field of view that you can see here is less than one arc minute, which would be about as much as you would expect anybody to be able to resolve. So the two planets here are much closer than you could possibly resolve. And so what you can imagine being seen in the sky is Jupiter and Venus getting closer and closer together night after night until the point comes where they would blur together and they would not be distinguished as two individual bright objects. They would effectively merge as one very bright object for as long as it took for them to separate and eventually become two objects again. This particular type of conjunction with the planets getting so close, their centres are only barely arc seconds apart rather than arc minutes. This is quite rare. I don't know exactly how often this has happened. I can believe that this would never happen in anybody's lifetime. I can believe that the astrologers that witnessed this would never have seen anything like this before in their lives and possibly even in whatever written records they had. I believe this sort of conjunction may have happened again since the Star of Bethlehem was seen, but I can't believe it's happened more than once or twice in the last 2,000 years. So this particular conjunction of Jupiter and Venus is very, very special, and as we can see from the date, it happened in June of 2 BC. So let me try and summarise what we've just said here. Oops, sorry, just zooming in again. So in 3 BC, in August, we had a conjunction, remember that's the symbol for conjunction, between Jupiter and Venus in the constellation of Leo. So that could be interpreted as Venus, birth, Jupiter, king, Leo, the line of Judea, birth of the king of the Jews. That was the first sign that astrologers had that something interesting was happening about the birth of the king of the Jews, but they weren't too sure what. Over the next few months, Jupiter, the king of planets, went past Regulus, the king of stars, not once, not twice, but three times because of the retrograde motion of Jupiter. So a so-called triple conjunction because they're in conjunction three times over the course of just a few months. So this dance of one king around another king could have been interpreted as a passage of uh, the, uh, the crown from one king to another. In other words, the end of Herod's reign, the start of uh, the Messiah's reign. What happened a few months later, as we've just seen, was that we have a very close conjunction, the closest conjunction that we can really conceive of. Jupiter and Venus once again in Leo, again birth of the king of the Jews, but this time it's so dramatic the planets have come together and fused into one very bright object that could have been the starting gun. That could have been the signal, go now. If you want to see the, uh, the king of the Jews, you've had the heads up, 
you've had the warning that there's going to be a change of king over in Judea. Now is the time to leave, get on your camel or start walking. We don't know if they rode camels. We don't know if they walked. We don't know how long it took them to go from wherever they were. We don't know if that was the Middle East or India or Mongolia or whatever. We don't know how long it took them, but one possibility is that it took them quite a few months. And remember I said Jupiter carried on on its way. Well, eventually Jupiter went into retrograde motion again and stopped in the sky a second time. When did Jupiter stop in the sky a second time? Well, it happened to be, by pure coincidence, December the 25th. There's no particular relevance to that. We know the current Christian holiday of 25th of December is based on a pagan festival, and we know that's why 25th of, November, 25th of December was chosen as the celebration of Christmas, not because we thought that was when Christ was born, but simply because it was a pagan festival celebrating the passing of the longest night. So at that point, Jupiter stops in the sky. And perhaps, maybe, that was the point at which the Magi arrived at Bethlehem. So we have a number of possibilities. We know what happened in the sky and we can guess or we can, we can make some sort of an educated guess as to how the ast astrological significance would have been interpreted for those events that we see outlined there in the timetable. So possibly this set of conjunctions between Jupiter and uh, Venus that we've seen there, these conjunctions that happen twice, once a reasonably close conjunction, secondly a very close conjunction, in, in tandem with the fact that Jupiter was in a triple conjunction with Regulus just a few months earlier in between the conjunctions of Venus and Jupiter, perhaps it was this series of conjunctions that inspired the account in the Gospel of St Matthew for those five points that we've addressed in trying to reconcile astronomy with the account in the Bible. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, maybe it was something completely different, or maybe it was a combination of some of the factors that I've been through, whether it be conjunctions, comets, nova, something else. The bottom line is, we cannot tell. Determining the astronomical facts is not that difficult. Anybody with some uh, planetarium software can dial the the time back, just watch out for year zero, remember? You can dial the clock back to a few years BC and you can see what was in the sky, what the planets were doing, would this have been visible in the morning sky, would it have been a star in the east for instance? So the astronomical facts are easy to determine. Second guessing the significance that the Magi or other astrologers might have attributed to those events, that's a different matter, that's purely speculation. So we can say the astronomical facts are there. This conjunction definitely took place. This conjunction definitely took place. We are OK on the time to within, astronomically speaking, probably a few hours. We don't actually know when Christ was born, so we can't pin it down to um, tying up and synchronising exactly with the birth of Christ. Astronomy is easy. Astrology takes a lot of guesswork. But regardless, the underlying message is the same. And I'm not going to wish you that message because it's September and it's far too early, but still, you know what the message is. Thank you all for listening.